Hello, my name is Aubrey Erian with Erian Lumber Company. We are a small specialty hardwoods business located in northern Pennsylvania. Uh, this is my second video of my three-part series on drying lumber. If you haven't watched the first one, that'd be a good place to start since there's relevant information that uh, I'm not going to go back over in this video. So I've spent the past 12 years or so experimenting with different drying techniques, uh, modifying and constructing dry kilns and building on the knowledge base that my father brought with him from years of drying lumber for furniture making. Um, I often have people contact me with questions about drying and thought I would make an informative video series containing what I've learned through researching, uh, experimenting, and talking to kiln operators with decades of experience. Uh, in this video, I'm going to cover dry kiln construction, uh, controls, loading, and operation. Just as a standard disclaimer, this is how I dry lumber. It's not the only way to dry lumber properly, and I'm not here to tell anybody that they're doing it wrong. Um, I know my techniques work because I end up with a defect-free, stable product, but there's other ways to get there, so please dry at your own risk. Um, dry kilns can be made very simply and cheaply. It's essentially just an insulated box with fans and a heat source. There's four common types of kilns, uh, conventional, dehumidification, uh, solar, and vacuum. And I'll be covering conventional and dehumidification kilns. I've never run vacuum kilns or solar kilns, and I don't plan to. Um, they're not really well suited to our operation. I think solar kilns are great for an individual and a tinkerer, but they're obviously reliant on sunshine and tough to make work for commercial applications. And um, our kilns uh, do run on solar power. Uh, the electric functions run on solar power um, and they are gas fired. Um, while vacuum kilns do dry very efficiently, they're prohibitively expensive. They're usually small in board footage. They're a pain to load and they're overly complicated with lots of stuff to break and have to replace. Um, I'm sure to have plenty of dissenters out there in the comments section. So I just wanna make clear, this is just my opinion. You can find plenty of people online espousing the virtues of vacuum kilns. If you like tinkering, you got plenty of time on your hands and money to blow, then hey man, vacuum kilns for you. But uh, if you like simplicity and cost is effective, then it doesn't get much simpler, cheaper than a conventional kiln. Um, so you'll need baffles and enough fans to make sure that the air is forced through the pack evenly. More smaller fans is gonna be better than a few big ones. Um, and then it's important to cover any gaps so that the only route for the air is through the lumber. If you have like two stacks deep, you can stagger the packs so that they um, cover the holes, or you can use uh, like tarps, uh, like heavy truckers tarps, plywood, or metal roofing, anything that you have to cover those gaps. Um, uh, keeping weight on the lumber is uh, key to not getting pile bend and twisting and warping. We used steel encased concrete weight packs, um, but a decently cheap alternative is to use uh, window lintels from your local building supply store. They are um, just concrete that's uh, four inches by eight inches by four feet long, and you just put them every two feet um, on top of your stickers. So next you're gonna need an inlet at one end of the kiln, and uh, a dryer vent works well for that. Um, and then an exhaust at the other end of the kiln uh, with some kind of small blower and a way to adjust the airflow. Uh, less is more when it comes to exhaust. Unless you're running a large kiln, um, drying from dead green, or you're in a huge hurry and trying to get dry as fast as possible, then you're not going to need that much exhaust. And, you know, I would caution against doing any of those things uh, as it's a good way to ruin your lumber. 
the heat source, uh, you can use anything for heat source from a heat lamp to hydronic or electric baseboards. Um, there's direct fired methods too, but they tend to be a little bit more um, dangerous uh, and more complicated. So, um, you know, run those at your own risk. So most hardwoods can be dried at up to 140 to 150 degrees without any trouble. Um, some can go higher than that. Uh, but you'll find that most fans don't hold up at those kind of temperatures, with the exception of three-phase fans, which I think they can go up to, some of them can go up to as much as 200 degrees um, and hold up pretty decent. But um, you can dry at lower temperatures, especially if you're drying easier woods like maple and cherry, or if you're drying thin material. Um, it'll take longer, but it'll be safer for the lumber. Um, once you get into thicker stock, and more difficult woods, you're going to want to be able to get to 140 degrees. So for a dehumidification kiln, the principles are pretty much the same. You just replace the inlet and outlet with a dehumidifier. Um, I've personally moved away from dehum kilns. It's just one more expensive piece of equipment to break down. Uh, it limits your drying temperature because most uh, dehumidifiers can't work at above 130 degrees or so. And um, when it does break, you have to climb into a hot kiln and try to repair it. Um, you know, in contrast, a conventional kiln uses a small blower and a inlet valve. I mean, it's, it's very simple. Um, and, you know, if you have to replace that blower, it costs you maybe a hundred bucks. So now on to the most complicated issue of running your kilns well, um, and that's humidity control. I don't like to see my EMC get much below 5%. Um, so that's equilibrium moisture content. And at 140 degrees, that's about 30% relative humidity. So let's go out and talk about um, EMC real quick. EMC is the driest moisture content that a wood can reach at a given temperature and relative humidity. That's to say that if I exposed the wood to air that's 140 degrees and 30% relative humidity, the moisture of that wood will not get below 5% moisture content. Uh, there's lots of charts that you can use to look up this information. Um, you can find them on Google. Uh, they're, uh, they're all over the Internet. So um, if you just search for an EMC chart, um, you'll find that. And there's lots of other charts out there that are really helpful, too, um, like uh, um, Ligdomat and Delmhorst have temperature correction charts for moisture content reading. Um, and there's lots of good uh, um, uh, information out there from the – uh, forestry service too um, that's worth checking out and uh, you know keeping on hand all right so back to humidity control the reason that we don't want the air to get below five percent emc is because you risk over drying the lumber and collapsing the cells so if you air dry to 20 percent or lower moisture content and you don't let your kiln fall below 5% EMC, you run very little risk of damaging your lumber. So first we have to figure out how are you gonna measure the relative humidity in your kiln. Then we use relative humidity and a temperature chart to determine your EMC. There's two common methods for measuring relative humidity. Um, one is using a wet bulb dry bulb method. Um, I'm not gonna get into that because it takes some time to explain. and I personally, I don't like using them. They're a pain because you have to have a water source for them. Um, you have to change out the wicks, uh, especially in the wintertime when stuff's freezing, if your kiln sits for any time. I just use digital sensors, and they work great, uh, especially if you're not getting over 150 degrees. Um, Onset makes a really nice little unit that's relatively cheap and well-made. But I've moved away from them since I discovered T and D. Um, the T&D units are not quite as well made, in my opinion, but they're around the same price as onsets, and they have Wi-Fi capability and free cloud service. So that means I can monitor my temperature and relative humidity remotely from a desktop or an app on my phone. 
Um, and I can set it up to send me alarms to my email if any of my measurements are out of range. Uh, this is really handy and it's an easy to use system and I use it as a backup on all of my um, custom, uh, all my kiln units that have the custom kiln controls that I've built. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really handy. I think they're around 180 bucks or something like that. But if you're getting into a kiln, it's really worth having that, even if you use it as a backup system. So now that we've covered monitoring, we have to talk about controlling the humidity. In a perfect world, if you had a hermetically sealed kiln, um, you could seal it up at the end of the cycle and the core and shell um, and the air would all reach equilibrium with no need to add moisture to it. Since none of my kilns are actually airtight, um, the air is always going to be a little bit drier than the shell, which is going to be a little bit drier than the core. So to get the lumber equalized and conditioned properly, I have to add moisture to the kiln at the end of the cycle. This is less of an issue with four quarter lumber or easy drying hardwoods, but it becomes really essential when you're drying heavy stock or mixed loads. Uh, there's plenty of ways to add moisture. Some people just dump buckets of water on the floor of the kiln at the end of the cycle, or they'll use a drip hose, but I like getting into the air so it atomizes decently well. Um, I started out by using cheap agricultural mister systems that are just on a timer, and then I'd adjust the timer until I got the relative humidity that I wanted. Um, I just put the misters right above the fan, and it creates a really fine mist and atomizes when the air off of the fan hits it. Um, I've since started building carbonator pumps, which put out um, higher pressure, and they get even better atomization. And then I use Arduino microcontrollers to control the pump, as well as the other functions of the kiln. Um, at some point when we have finished programming and testing the Arduino systems, I'll be releasing the schematics and code for it. This information is open source and it's designed for operating LED lights only, not for heaters and fans. So for liability reasons, I'm telling you that um, this is not designed for dry kilns or commercial use. <clears throat> With this system, I can view and adjust the relative humidity and temperature of the kiln. I can check the core moisture content and I can override any functions all from my cell phone. I've spent the past year collaborating with one of my employees who's um, really good with Arduinos and electronics in general. And um, we went a bit overkill with the accuracy of the moisture content function to begin with, um, but he managed to pare it down, simplify it significantly. So it has species correction built into the program, but not temperature correction. So all of my readings are done at assuming that the kiln is at 140 degrees. So if it's not currently at 140 degrees, then I have to correct for it. But that's usually the temperature that I finish the cycle at. Um, so it's not, it, does, it doesn't really end up being an issue. So that concludes my second video. Um, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos and content. Um, I'll be putting out one more video, and uh, that will cover uh, mixing different species and thicknesses um, in your kilns, uh, kiln schedules, um, conditioning, testing, storing, and acclimating your lumber. So please feel free to leave any questions or comments below, and um, thanks for watching.